possible solution to the Fermi paradox found, the dark forest theory. The universe is filled with stars, and this is no news. But nowadays, we're also quite sure the universe is filled with the planets as well. I mean, observation has shown that we can find planets everywhere in the universe. And given that a star can house multiple planets, planets are more numerous. So far, we discovered something like 5,000 confirmed exoplanets. And this is a really small number to be able to make accurate predictions in science. For instance, it took us two centuries to come up with a theory about stellar evolution and classification. And the number of stars that it took was something like 250,000. In order to come up with a similar understanding of planets, we will need much more than that, because they are numerous, but they are all different. This is just to say that we are at the beginning of the exoplanets era, and we expect everything to change in some years. It will probably take some time, though. Studying and understanding exoplanets are crucial to get some hints about the philosophical position that we occupy in the universe. But are we alone? This question has always haunted us, and we don't seem to have an answer to it. But we're working on that. The so-called Fermi Paradox is based on the assumption that a lot of planets exist and that the Earth is not so special. In this case, given the multitude of planets in the universe, how come we never got to communicate with aliens? Where is everyone? But now we might have an answer. You may have heard about the Fermi Paradox before. Simply explained, it asks the question, if intelligent life is common in the universe, then where is everybody? Well, if you know something about both history and physics, I'm sure you're also aware that Fermi was a nuclear physicist, and he contributed to the creation of the first prototype nuclear reactor. So what does he exactly have to do with aliens? He never really wrote much about extraterrestrials. Everything started in Los Alamos. Fermi was sitting and chatting with his colleagues about a cartoon showing aliens. These aliens were found in New York City, just popping out of a flying saucer carrying trash cans in New York City. Fermi was known for his sense of humor and intelligence. He was a smart guy. Suddenly, literally out of the blue, he asked, where is everybody? His colleagues, who were as smart as him, knew what he was referring to. Everyone understood Fermi was referring to the fact that there wasn't any solid evidence of aliens out there. No one ever came in touch with us. Why was that? Why have we never received a message or something to greet us? With his question, Fermi was trying to express these thoughts. There was no solid evidence of aliens visiting our big blue planet. Then, of course, the conversation went on. I mean, we're talking about nerd scientists, among the best scientists in the world. They like having long conversations about cool stuff. That's why they turned to the topic of interstellar travel, where Fermi concluded interstellar flight might not be possible, might not be worth the effort, or technological civilization doesn't last long enough to invent interstellar travel. Now, I wouldn't say Fermi was completely wrong, but keep in mind that we are talking about 1950. At that time, powerful rockets were still a dream and they hadn't yet reached Earth's orbit. One thing you have to understand about this is Fermi really never questioned the possibility of alien civilizations. He only asked himself the question, could we ever travel in the universe from a star to another, from a planet in the solar system to an exoplanet? Basically, the Fermi paradox wasn't created by Fermi. In any case, across all the billions of light years of the starry sky above us, could we possibly be the only life? Scientists have explored this equation for years. In 1961, physicist Frank Drake developed a mathematical equation to help solve it. We as a civilization have been broadcasting into space since 1974. So according to this equation, even if we cease to exist as a species in 2074, there would be 10 intelligent civilizations in our galaxy alone. To break these numbers down further, scientists use the Kardashev scale, which splits intelligent life into three categories. Type 1 civilizations are able to use all the energy available on their home planet. We are approaching this. Most scientists agree that we are currently at a 0.7 on the Kardashev scale, with a full Type 1 being about a century off. Type 2 civilizations can control and channel all the energy of their host star and Type 3 civilizations have access to power equivalent to that of their host galaxy. Even before the Drake Equation and the Kardashev Scale, many scientists were convinced that there must be a plethora of intelligent civilizations sprinkled across the galaxy. But the question remains, if there were civilizations scattered across the stars by the billions, why haven't we heard from them? 
It is from these questions, the Drake Equation and the Kardashev Scale, that the true paradox was born. The Milky Way is about 10 billion years old and 100,000 light years across. If aliens had spaceships that could travel at 1% of the speed of light, the galaxy could have already been colonized 1,000 times. Why haven't we heard from any other life? Now, we really have no idea how many advanced alien civilizations might be out there, and the Drake Equation's parameters are far from being defined with absolute certainty. Still, many solutions to the Fermi Paradox have been suggested over the years. One of them is called the Dark Forest Theory. According to this scenario, you have to picture the universe as a vast dark forest, with humans living on Earth just like every other alien is living on their own planet somewhere out there. Only the aliens are the hunters waiting to catch us. Of course, the hunter doesn't make a sound and doesn't light a torch to draw attention to himself. Otherwise, we would be able to see him and run away. Of course, no one said the hunter is a Maleficent one, and maybe to be noticed might be harmless. But what if being noticed, we caught the attention of someone else? Hey, if you're still watching, it means you're loving this video. Why don't you subscribe to the channel? What if another competitor noticed us? While the idea of the dark forest theory comes from a novel, it can be a solution to the Fermi Paradox. We're not sure about the aliens and intelligent forms of life out there. We don't know if they're evil or good. We don't know anything about them. So we should probably be careful when it comes to communicating with them. Because humans might not have interstellar travel yet, we sure know how to communicate with aliens. We know how to send signals to other galaxies. Interstellar travel might not be possible right now, but interstellar communication is available. For instance, the simplest way to communicate with another alien civilization is the laser. Lasers are powerful beams of light. Once you send one, it will start traveling at the speed of light in the universe, reaching stars, planets, and comets. Of course, the speed of light is finite, despite it being very fast. This means that signals would be affected by delays. But this is not a huge problem. It's only a matter of time. In any case, we have done so much more than sending some radio laser signals in the universe. Humankind has been unintentionally transmitting signals into space, primarily high-frequency radio, television, and radar for more than 50 years. Our earliest TV broadcasts have reached several thousand nearby stars, although any alien viewers would have to build a very large antenna, thousands of acres in size, to detect them. Until now, SETI researchers have not been very interested in broadcasting. The reasons for this are several. To begin with, we are a technologically young civilization. We've had radio for a hundred years or so, but there are surely societies that have possessed the ability to send high-powered signals for tens of thousands, if not millions of years. Consequently, since we are the new kids on the technology block, it may behoove us to listen first. Some have also expressed concerns that broadcasting might be dangerous, literally calling attention to our existence. However, the evidence of technologically sophisticated life on Earth is already on its way into space, and there is no bringing back these transmissions. Moreover, speaking of the signals we sent in outer space, the Voyager probes are already on their way out of the solar system, and if there is an intelligent civilization out there, they could be intercepted. These probes are the representatives of humanity in the universe. Is this a good or bad thing? We don't know yet, but we can be sure of one thing. We did more than light the torch in the dark forest. The dark forest theory is quite a dark theory. We've been screaming our existence to the cosmos for almost 100 years now. Any aliens within a 100 light year radius of us would be receiving a barrage of radio signals from our direction. If we had reason to avoid letting aliens know about us, as Stephen Hawking thought we did, we might have a problem. Why haven't we heard from aliens yet? If this solution is correct, they are purposely hiding in the darkness of space for fear of death. Should we stop broadcasting our existence to the universe too then? Or would alien life be a little nicer than we've been in our history? The Rare Earth Hypothesis Basically, according to this hypothesis, life and the evolution of complexity require a combination of astrophysical and geological conditions that are simply not common in our universe. In other words, we are quite special and unique. If this hypothesis was true, we would be in a real messy situation. Astronomy and mostly cosmology today assume the prevalence of intelligent life in our universe because we think the universe is isotropic. For isotropy, we mean that the universe is the same in all directions, on a macroscopic scale. 
You can't understand isotropy thinking of a sphere. If you are at the center of this sphere and you point towards different directions, nothing changes. All of this is also consistent with the Copernican principle, which argues that if something is randomly sampled, it is likely to be representative of the majority. If we translate this in the astronomy and cosmology field, the Copernican principle is telling us that Earth-like planets are common in our universe. We need such an assumption. We need the Copernican principle because if the universe wasn't isotropic, it would be very dangerous and actually almost impossible to make quantitative studies of the objects we observe, such as galaxies, stars, and planets. We needed to set up our mathematical understanding of the world. If the Copernican principle doesn't hold, then Earth is actually not representative of the whole and is in a class reserved for very few planets. Maybe Earth is an outlier. Given the fact that we haven't found any evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence in the universe yet, wouldn't this seem like the more plausible scenario? The rare Earth argument is based on two hypotheses. The first one is that microbial life is common in planetary systems. The second one states that advanced life is rare in the universe. If we combine these two hypotheses, we understand that Earth-like planets may evolve from a series of events and circumstances that are quite rare, making Earth a very special place. This argument was in response to the inherent assumptions and biases that were identified in the Drake Equation, which essentially asserts that intelligent life should be plentiful. For example, Ward and Brownlee, authors of the book on Rare Earth Hypothesis, wrote, They also say life originated here about 4 billion years ago and then evolved from single-celled organisms to multicellular creatures with tissues and organs, climaxing in animals and higher plants and then ask themselves if this particular history of life, one of increasing complexity to an animal grade of evolution, is an inevitable result of evolution or even a common one. Maybe it could be just a rare combination. Mathematically, the Drake equation can be expressed as a product of various factors. N is the number of civilizations in our galaxy. R star is the average rate of star formation. Fp is the fraction of stars that have planets. NE is the number of planets that can support life. FL is the number that will develop life. FI is the number that will develop intelligent life. FC is the number of advanced civilizations, and L is the length of time that these civilizations would have to transmit their signals into space. This equation aims to compute the number of civilizations in our galaxy. Of course, the more we study and understand the universe, the more precise are our constraints on the factors. For example, astronomers now estimate that there are between 250 and 500 billion stars in our galaxy, which forms new stars at a rate of about three solar masses per year. The discovery of over 4,000 extrasolar planets in the past few decades has also allowed astronomers to get a much better sense of how many stars have planets and the number of planets that are likely to be habitable. In fact, based on Kepler data, a study conducted in 2013 estimated that there could be as many as 40 billion Earth-sized planets orbiting in the habitable zones of their stars, 11 billion of which would be orbiting sun-like stars. Nevertheless, there is still a great deal of uncertainty in the Drake equation, especially when it comes to the emergence of life, at a rate at which life will rise to intelligent life and everything that follows. But as we said, Ward and Brownlee were skeptical about Drake's theory. That's why they presented a new version of the equation in their book. It looks pretty much like this. Here, n stars the number of stars in the Milky Way. n e is the average number of planets in a star's habitable zone. h z f g is the fraction of stars in the galactic. h z f p is the fraction of stars in the Milky Way with planets. f p m is the fraction of rocky planets. f i is the fraction of habitable planets where microbial life arises. Fc is the fraction of planets where complex life evolves, and there are a lot of other parameters that we have to take into account if we want a good estimate of n. They even try to take into account the extinction events that could happen during the evolution of an intelligent species. Like the Drake equation factors, these are also subject to constraints and uncertainties. But using Earth as a template and employing the Copernican principle, it's easy to see how it would be difficult to find planets that meet all of the above listed criteria. Ward and Brownlee also listed other factors that were peculiar to Earth and are believed to have contributed to the emergence and evolution of life. For example, there's the presence of plate tectonics, which have been fundamental to climate stability here on Earth. 
and they also cited geological evidence that indicated that twice in our planet's history, the Earth was very cold and covered in ice. This is what astrophysicists call snowball Earth epochs. These epochs occurred roughly 2.2 billion and 635 million years ago, both of which conceded with key developments in terrestrial life. The latter snowball period coincided with the Cambrian explosion, 570 and 530 million years ago, which was characterized by a burst of species diversification and the appearance of almost all animal lineages that exist today. In other words, key events in the evolution of life on Earth appear to have followed a snowball Earth period. North Sentinel Island is a place where a tribe that separated from the rest of civilization more than 60,000 years ago and who are currently studied from a distance as if they were a zoo. But just as we study the inhabitants of North Sentinel Island as if it were a zoo, would it be possible that an extraterrestrial race much more advanced than us could be studying the human race as if we were a zoo? North Sentinel Island North Sentinel Island is a small island at the Bay of Bengal in the Indian Ocean. This island is a part of the Andaman Islands archipelago, which belongs to India. What makes North Sentinel Island unique is that it is inhabited by an indigenous tribe known as the Sentinelese, who have lived in isolation with virtually no contact with the outside world for approximately 60,000 years. In theory, the island belongs to the administrative district of South Andaman, part of Indian Union territory of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Still, the Indian authority recognized the islanders' desire to live without contact with the world. Indian laws do not apply to the Sentinelese, who manage their affairs internally. Therefore, the island can be considered a de facto sovereign entity under Indian protection since the Sentinelese themselves are unaware of the existence of said country and their membership in it. Given that the Sentinelese do not, in practice, carry out any customs, activity, or maintain relations with anyone outside the island, these powers that India assumes are more theoretical than real since the island's inhabitants have never agreed anything with anyone. Sentinelese tribe is known for their hostility towards outsiders and their resistance to any form of outside contact. They have rejected attempts at reproachment by explorers, fishermen, and Indian authorities on numerous occasions. The Indian government has established a policy of voluntary isolation and protection of these Sentinelese to preserve their culture and protect them from possible diseases that could devastate their population since they have no immunity to common diseases such as flu or measles. Due to the danger of approaching North Sentinel Island and the established isolation policy, the island is one of the world's most inaccessible and mysterious places. Access to the island is prohibited by law, and Indian authorities have implemented an exclusion zone to protect the Sentinelese and anyone trying to approach. Why has it been decided to leave this tribe alone? It has been decided to leave the island's inhabitants alone because any contact with modern civilization could pose a mortal risk for them and anyone who tries to approach them. Throughout history, there have been various encounters with the inhabitants of the island. Some of them are, in 1880, the British ship Rifleman approached North Sentinel Island and the ship's captain left gifts on the beach before departing. Later, a group of Sentinelese were seen breaking up and squashing the gifts, suggesting that the gifts were not accepted. 1896 The British government sent an expedition led by Maurice Vidal Portman to try and establish contact with the Sentinelese. The expedition was essentially a failure and resulted in the capture of several Sentinelese who were taken to the main island of the Andamans. However, the captured Sentinelese soon fell ill and it was decided to return them to their land of origin. 1970 During the 1970s, Indian authorities made occasional trips to North Sentinel in an attempt to gain friendship of the tribe. They were usually organized at the request of leaders in search of adventure. On one of these expeditions, they left two pigs and a doll on the shore. But later, the Sentinelese hunted the pigs with their spears and buried them along with the doll, indicated that the gifts were not accepted. These visits became more regular in the 1980s. 
The teams tried to land in places out of reach of the arrows and left gifts such as coconuts, bananas, and pieces of iron. Sometimes the sentinelese seemed to make friendly gestures. Other times, they would take the gifts into the jungle and then shoot arrows at the group, trying to establish contact. Apparently, in 1991, there seems to have been a breakthrough. When the researchers arrived at North Sentinel, the tribe signaled for them to bring them gifts. And then, for the first time, they approached without their weapons. They even got into the water and approached the boats to collect more coconuts. However, this friendly contact did not last long. Although the gift-bearing trips continued for some years, the encounters were not always friendly. Sentinelese sometimes pointed their arrows at the group, trying to make contact, and on one occasion they attacked a wooden boat with their adzes, stone axes for cutting wood. No one knows why the Sentinelese abandoned and then resumed their hostility towards contact missions. Still, many researchers think it is likely that after the first approach, some Sentinelese fell ill and died from catching the flu or measles, causing the islanders to distrust the gifts and to return to their rejection and hostility. In 1996, regular gift-giving missions were ended, as many researchers began to question the logic of trying to contact people who are healthy and content and have had lived prosperously independently for more than 55,000 years. Friendly contact alone had devastating consequences and prolonged contact with the Sentinelese would almost certainly have had tragic consequences. In subsequent years, only occasional visits took place. After the 2004 tsunami, researchers made two visits to verify from a distance that the tribe appeared to be healthy and had not suffered in any way from the ravages of the tsunami. They also confirmed that the hostilities continued because when they flew over the island by helicopter, they were greeted with arrows from its inhabitants. India then declared that it would not attempt new contacts with the Sentinelese. North Sentinel Island and its inhabitants who have evolved wholly isolated from the rest of civilization do not want or need to establish relations with us. However, even though they don't want to know anything about us, we do want to know a lot about them. A human zoo? It is likely that among the island's inhabitants, some curious people wonder where those men come from who dress in such colorful clothes on those boats that can cross the ocean. The Sentinelese cannot produce fire, but it is known that they can manipulate it. When lightning strikes and produces fire, they can feed it and maintain it for long periods, but once it goes out, they cannot generate it again. Perhaps after many years since the last contact with our civilization, the youngest members of the island occasionally see lights in the distance from passing boats hundreds or thousands of kilometers away and wonder how we can catch the sunlight in small spaces to illuminate us at night. For decades, several boats were shipwrecked on the island, and most of them contained metal which today is known to have been used to make the tips of their arrows harder. This is somewhat paradoxical, since although we have made great efforts to keep the members of the island isolated from the rest of civilization, we have indirectly provided them with materials and technologies that in everyday situations they would never have. In the case of humanity, we first mastered fire and then began to produce metal from much more complex processes. Still, the Sentinelese are taking that path in reverse, having metal at their disposal without first mastering fire. We have unintentionally changed how they continue to evolve and how they see the world. The most curious members of the island may occasionally look at the sky to contemplate the stars and are surprised that every so often a train of stars that move one after another cross the sky. And every day they also manage to observe much more colorful stars that blink and move quickly in seemingly random directions. They do not know that those strange stars are not stars but creations of humanity specifically satellites and airplanes, technologies they cannot even imagine. We can photograph the island from space with artificial satellites or observe it with binoculars thanks to modern technology. We also have technology to listen to what is happening on the island and cameras to photograph what they do. In this sense, could we say that the North Sentinel Island is a human zoo? Although it sounds somewhat cruel, seen from a scientific point of view, it probably is, since zoos are places where a specific species is kept, isolated, and under observation. 
trying as hard as possible not to interrupt its natural behavior or, if possible, study it without them realizing it. The Sentinelese are humans isolated on an island that guards a nation, where we can't always know who enters and who leaves. We can observe them whenever we want and study their behavior all the time. Furthermore, they do not know that they are being observed and studied by us. So, the question is, would it be possible that, just as we study the Sentinelese without them realizing it, an extraterrestrial race could do the same with humans without us realizing it? It may sound weird, but let's remember that there are many things in the universe that we do not understand. Our technology does not yet allow us to carefully observe what happens on each planet of each star in the entire galaxy. What if, on the other side of the Milky Way, there is a Type II alien civilization on the Kardashev scale that is currently in the process of becoming a Type III civilization and has designated the Earth as a zoo to study life for billions of years? In this case, this civilization would have designated a sector of the Milky Way as a huge zoo made up of thousands of stars. All the stars in that sector, including the Sun, would be part of that enormous zoo which is the property of this extraterrestrial civilization with technology to observe what happens on each planet simultaneously. As well as in the North Sentinel Island, human civilization governs itself, but at the same time they are part of a conglomerate of stars with an owner and a name. We could be inside that enormous zoo, but we do not realize it. A sufficiently advanced civilization could study all the time what happens in our solar system and precisely what happens on our planet just to see how the human race evolves, and we would not be able to notice since they do not want to contact us. They only want to observe and study us without interrupting our evolution as a species, just as we did with the Sentinelese. If the Earth were a zoo, then would we be like the Sentinelese, a civilization being observed studied and possibly even protected by that much more advanced civilization that does not want to come into contact with us for our safety? Could it be that just as we have diseases that could decimate the population of North Sentinel Island, an extraterrestrial race could have diseases that could decimate the entire human race? Alien Police Scenario of the Fermi Paradox Predicting what technology will be like in a century or even thousands of years is a game of educated guesswork. For example, during the American Civil War, no one could have foreseen that a century later the atom would be tamed and nuclear weapons with the ability to end civilization would exist. They just had no foundation for making such a prediction. On the other side, the notion of traveling to the moon was on the table, thanks to the efforts of Jules Verne, who published From the Earth to the Moon in 1865. He anticipated humanity would travel to the moon someday, but he couldn't have imagined that it would happen barely over a century later. Because we have evolved so much in such a short amount of time, it is possible that we still have a long way to go in terms of technical growth, both with things we can predict such as Dyson swarms and those we cannot predict. The latter is the eerie aspect of technology. Entire hypothetical technology, such as the entire consequences of nanotechnology, remain mostly unexplored by humans. We've started the adventure, but we have no idea where we're going. And then there are completely unknown future technologies that we don't even know the science for yet. We still don't know a lot of the science that is hidden from us. Huge gaps exist in our understanding of the universe. The best example for this would be that general relativity and quantum mechanics do not line up even though they are both correct. This tells us that there are missing pieces of physics that we still need to discover. We have some puzzle pieces, but we don't know how many more are missing. This might imply that there are really harmful technologies in our future that we have not yet imagined. While traveling to the moon was predicted in the 1860s, the nuclear bomb was not. That requires a trip back in time to 1914 and H.G. Wells' classic The World Set Free. So the concept of nuclear war, humanity's greatest technical existential danger, emerged seemingly out of nowhere and very quickly. This might occur again. But thus far, we've only done things that have an impact on the Earth. It is possible that there are technologies out there that are so hazardous that they may destroy entire galaxies, if not the entire universe. The answer is that it may be. A lot of theories have been made in regards to galaxy-threatening devices. 
The most famous example is the paperclip maker, in which someone constructs the machine with a specific purpose to produce paperclips, and it escapes and begins converting the entire galaxy into paperclips. Another example would be self-replicating probes with no limit on reproduction that actually consumes the galaxy, transforming it into copies of themselves. Another type of cosmic danger would be generalized, very powerful artificial intelligence, which may choose to eliminate all biology, enslave it, or change it wherever it finds it. Then there are the mysteries of the cosmos itself. As I said in a previous video, the universe may not exist in its lowest potential energy state, and if it ever did, it would send out a shock wave at the speed of light, destroying all matter in the universe in its current form. Is it feasible, given a comprehensive enough understanding of physics, for someone to do the incorrect experiment and set it off? The answer is probably no, but it's in such a confusing region of physics that it can't be ruled out just yet. This creates a dilemma. How do you prevent a civilization from posing a cosmic danger if it is capable of doing so? This brings us to what I refer to as the alien police scenario. This is sort of a variant of the zoo hypothesis, but it's more specific and speculative. Once you realize such far-fetching hazards are feasible, it makes logical sense to police the galaxy, and anybody coming into contact with these technologies must either be warned not to do so or be forcibly stopped. Consider it this way, you're sitting on your porch, taking in the scenery. You'll see police cars patrolling the area on a regular basis, but unless you're clearly breaking the law, they won't pay attention to you. They simply pass on by their patrol. However, if you were taking your neighbor's barbecue and dragging it back to your property while your neighbor yelled for the cops, the cops would stop and you would stop stealing it. This might be how different galaxies might work. There are police investigations taking on the inhabited advancement of growing civilizations. They stay concealed, much like a traffic cop, until they notice you doing something or reaching a level of technology that necessitates their involvement for the sake of the whole galaxy's safety. Your personal safety, on the other hand, may be of secondary importance. If you choose to do something that will cause your own extinction, that is, not the galaxy's concern, and you are free to do anything you want, if you go beyond that, you will be stopped. It's fun to imagine what this monitoring and intervention situation may look like. To inspire the phrase good cop, bad cop, there may be a combination of police investigations from various civilizations, some forgiving, some not, and it all depends on who gets to you first. Alternatively, if the first probe establishes peaceful contact and issues a cease and desist order and is disregarded, the second probe becomes more aggressive. If you don't stop, you'll be exterminated by a hostile alien civilization police probe. Or it may be a single, all-powerful probe launched by all civilizations working together to enforce galactic safety standards. It might easily destroy or downshift any dangerous civilization. These are some possibilities that can be possible. Does it seem like nations and politicians on Earth already? Another possibility is that if the offending technological development is the result of a conflict on a planet, the probe may act as a mediator in the dispute to avoid the development entirely, and then adopt a trust but verify stance with the civilization, knowing that there is always a death probe sitting in their star system. Another scenario here approaches it from a different angle. Aside from technical surveillance, a police investigation may have another purpose. It might also serve as a kind of defense. Why if such a probe was discovered to be considerably more powerful than anything required to destroy or reset your civilization. It can prevent you from creating weapons to match it fairly early on, so there must be another reason. The question then becomes, are those weapons present for your own protection? Then you must consider what it is protecting you against. These are always the creepiest Fermi Paradox situations since they imply the existence of something malicious out there, and you need to be protected from it. The probe becomes a sentinel waiting for anything from the depths of space to assault at which point it will spring to life to protect you. Perhaps the galaxy has vanquished that danger throughout the period the probe has been around, which might be millions of years, or vice versa, and the armed probe's creators are long gone, and the probe is no match for this enemy. Or the probe may be more than a match for the enemy. Consider the first civilization in the galaxy making errors and understanding the perils and rewards of millions of years of technological advancement. Imagine they've seen it all, battled other civilizations in technological progress wars, and eventually become the galaxy's police force. 
Perhaps this occurs in all galaxies with sentient life, with one overlord civilization developing and managing the rest, not in their own internal affairs, but in interplanetary affairs. To remove the risk of violence, maybe all communication between planets is handled by this safety police. The truly terrifying aspect about this scenario is that we may be in it without even realizing it. It's highly unlikely, but not zero. Another possibility is an idea about Von Neumann, Benford, and Bracewell probes. Any of those ideas can be applied here for a police probe. A probe may essentially perform two things to watch us. It could do it passively, say from anywhere within the solar system, or perhaps more ideally from the moon's surface. If it was suitably disguised and displayed only monitoring equipment smaller than the greatest resolution of our cameras, it might remain concealed eternally, merely waiting for us to violate galactic law. The second possibility is that it is deliberately monitoring us far more closely, and we have mostly dropped the ball and missed it. Such a probe may create atmospheric probes to see into the atmosphere and observe our actions more closely, or could conduct through scientific investigations of all life on Earth. People have frequently stated that humans would be like ants to an alien civilization, and they would not be interested in us. But the truth is that we're fascinated by ants in two ways. For starters, there are scientists on Earth that specialize on ants, and we've amassed a vast amount of knowledge about them. Ants are fascinating, to the extent that humans keep ant farms for educational and recreational purposes. However, we also interfere when we discover ants in places where they are not wanted, such as the kitchen. If ants go too far, whether consciously or not, the ants must leave. As a result, even if we aren't at an extraterrestrial civilization's technical level, they may be quite interested in us. And this is where the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon, or UAP, comes into play. The most likely avenue to an extraterrestrial explanation for the UAP phenomena is the concept of a probe sitting in the solar system watching us and creating smaller atmospheric probes. Now, a point to note here that these are matter of phenomena, plural, and there might be multiple explanations to their origins. Some may stay unknown for the rest of time, but at least there are attempts like the Galileo probe to try to figure out what's going on. However, there is a reasonable explanation for an extraterrestrial presence here. The question of whether or not there is one is quite different. But if that's the case, one of their motive for us being here is a police operation. 